you know, we, um, we think about this day of independence. And I think we have forgotten what it has really meant. And uh, I think the generations um, um, that come up now really don't embrace the sacrifice that was made that we have a free nation, that we can come here, that we can worship, that we can celebrate Jesus, that we can speak our hearts if that be our desire. 1776, 50 men signed a document written by Thomas Jefferson. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve a political bond which they have committed with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitles them. As the end speaks, one that is very familiar in this declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That document was a declaration of independence signed in Congress on July 4th, 1776, declaring America's freedom from the oppression or the oppressive rule of England. And freedom has been a battle cry from every American in this country for the past 231 years. The Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen as His heritage. Let me read that again. I don't know if I got you to put it up there yet. Uh, that was Psalms 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Would you agree with that? The, the title of our message this morning is Pursuit of Happiness. And I have a question mark behind my title there as I was thinking about it this week. Pursuit of Happiness. It's interesting. An interesting pursuit. I'd like us to do something, uh, you know, the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance declares without apology. <laughs> and, and it seems like our country does a lot of apologizing. But it declares without apology that America is one nation under God. I'm going to ask that you stand as we give a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag also. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. As a boy in school, I remember the very first things that we did in class was we made in a pledge of allegiance to the flag. First thing before the day started. The other thing that we did in the school that I attended was recite the 23rd Psalm. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing where we've come from and where we are today. I find it interesting that the founding fathers of our nation were for the most part, and lots of people like to argue this point, and I'm really not interested in their argument because it's false, but for the most part, the founders of this nation were Christian. Not religionist, but Christian men. We read the words of those men that signed the Declaration of Independence. We could see that their true intent, their true intent, and you can read it and any grade school kid could see that, the intent that was written in the Declaration and in our Constitution 
was that this nation be governed and directed by the Word of God. But this precious document has been abused and mistranslated to the point that all that it has ever stood for is lost. I want you just to imagine something. Suppose this week you turned on CNN and you heard this announcement. And it says, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has just issued this statement. Divine providence, that's God, has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Imagine you just heard that on the TV. Then you hear another one says, Inquiries by our reporters reveal that almost every state legislature has now passed a law requiring all elected officials to take this oath. And I quote, I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ His only Son, and I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament and the New Testament be given by divine inspiration. And to top it off, you hear another reporter say, legislation has passed today in Congress. Imagine you hear this. Legislation has passed today in Congress to affirm that the Congress of the United States approves and recommends the Holy Bible for use in the schools. Can you imagine? It's hard for us to believe that anything like that would ever be said on the news today or that people in our government would make such a statement. But they were said. It was John Jay, the first Chief Justice and the father of the Supreme Court, one of the primary authors of our Constitution who wrote, it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. The Chief Justice. I wonder if any of our Chief Justices would make that type of proclamation today. It was the state of Delaware, along with most of the rest of the states, which required office holders to take an oath affirming their Christian faith before they were allowed to even take office. And not only did Congress in 1782 approve the use of the Bibles for their schools, they even, they even paid for the Bibles with citizens' taxes. Can you believe that? In 1844, when someone sued to remove Remove them, the Supreme Court ruled in 1844, why should not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as a divine revelation in our schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? We have come a long ways. We have come a long ways. And so when people are telling me sometimes, and you'll, if you read, watch the History Channel or You'll read some of the most ridiculous books that have ever been written talking about that our leaders were not Christian men or women, that our leaders were not interested in a faith in Jesus Christ. That is hogwash because that is exactly what they were. These were men that stood that our nation recognized that we are a free nation only because of the divine direction that God has put us in. And I, you know... The Declaration of Independence may not be something that you read very often, but I've read it this week. And, and I've been thinking about the part that says that we have certain rights. Certain rights. When Thomas Jefferson, when he penned this Declaration of Independence, one of the most popular items was the very last part that I read, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And I'm not saying our nation was perfect even when they wrote these things. But, but, the, the, but the mindset and the direction in which they, they themselves knew that we needed to head was, was purposeful. That, 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 that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, which is who? God. With certain inalienable rights. And that among them, these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the title of the message today is The Pursuit of Happiness? Question mark. The pursuit of Happiness. Is this not the American dream? That we pursue the thing that makes us happy, the thing that makes us comfortable, the thing that we feel like is our right as a citizen to be happy. 
Now, I'd like to consider what it means this morning, I guess, and, and you know, how do we seek to bring happiness in our lives? Is happiness found in the American dream? Does the world around us look at the life of a Christian as one pursuing the life of happiness by the world's definition of what happiness is? Great risks have been taken by many throughout history because of their belief that there is a reward for such endeavor, the pursuit of happiness. That there is justification in giving of oneself for a greater purpose. And I suppose that there lies the dilemma for most of us. What is the greater purpose? What is our greater purpose? Is the greater purpose happiness? Is that what Thomas Jefferson believed that happiness should be? Or that our purpose should be a pursuit of joy, happiness, peace, comfort, freedom? I can't deny that as a believer that happiness is certainly a gift of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And there's no doubt that you can look at the word joy and you can certainly translate it to mean happiness. That's what he's talking about. It should be the fruit from what it is that people see in our lives. That we're happy. We're joyful people as believers. We come to this section in Luke chapter 6. We've been, we've been studying Luke for some time, I know. And, and we come to this place here in Luke chapter 6. And I'm not going to preach on it today because i got some other things to talk about. But, but we, we come to this place where he talks about the blessings and the woes. And, I, and there's too much for me to deal with today in that. So I'm not, we're going to wait until next Sunday before I, I deal with the blessings and, and the woes. But I want to ask you this morning. If you had a choice, if you had a choice... And, and, uh, of rather being rich or poor, happy or sad, popular and loved or hated, which would you choose? Don't answer quickly. And, and don't answer, well, consider your answer. I mean, because the natural thing is that I want to be happy, right? I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to be sick. I want to be loved by people. The natural part of us wants these things that make us feel good. And, and so when we get into the study next week, we start looking at the, the, the blessings and the woes. And we're not, going to, we're not going to present one without the other, okay? Because Jesus makes a point. Here's the things that you should be blessed with, and here's the things that you should not. It's woe to you. The word woe, if you look up it in the Greek, it's, it's, it's like if you saw your kid running out into the street. You know, you wouldn't say, woe. No. Well, if you saw your kid running out in the street, you go, Whoa! Wait a minute! And, and then everybody stops. You've got everybody's attention. Why? Because something, something very deathly is about to take place. Somebody may get run over. And you realize it, how important it is. When Jesus says, whoa, he means that you better stop doing these things. I, I'm not going to preach that today, though. But we, we, look at, we, we, look at, we look at this little section in Luke 6. <clears throat> This is just for benefit. We, we look here in, in Luke 6, and, and if, if you were to turn there, and you, and you can, you don't have to, but if, if you will turn there and look at, begin at, at uh, verse 17, and he goes down, verse 20, he starts saying, you know, blessed are you who are poor, uh, for yours is the kingdom of God, you know, blessed are you who are hungry, blessed are you who are satisfied. You know, and he, he goes into all these things, these blessings. Now, we know that the Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Everybody knows that, right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and he deals with this, and these are what we call the Beatitudes, or the blessings, or happiness. And, and so we see that in that area there, and, and there's just a couple of things that are different there. If you, if you look in Matthew chapter 5, you would see that he went up on a hill, and he spoke to his disciples. Okay? Now, if, if we look in Luke, if we look in Luke chapter 6, I think it says, he went down with them and stood on a level place. Now, is this the same place? the same place, Gary. Doesn't sound like the same place, does it? So what could it be? You know, here's what preachers do. I'm going to be preaching revival in uh, Warsaw at the end of September. Now, most likely, I won't be writing five brand new sermons for that church. That church will probably hear some of the same messages that you've heard. Okay? It won't be exactly the same because it's going to be to a different group of people. It'll be, it'll be focused to them. So, 
So, so that's what happens sometimes. Did Jesus teach the same things? Well, certainly he did. In different crowds that he was in, different places that he went. You think Paul, he, Paul had a different sermon for every group that he went to? If he went to a new church, he preached something that he preached at another church. It was a truth. So Jesus is talking to these people at this particular place on this plane, and he's telling them also about what it means to be blessed, how it means to be happy, how to pursue happiness. So next week we'll talk about each of these individual blessings in, in more detail. But I just want you to see what's taking place in this little area that we are in Luke. And, and I wonder if Thomas Jefferson was considering this mindset of happiness when he, when he said that every American had the right to pursue this type of happiness. This type of happiness. Because we see here in, in Luke 6 that Jesus says, blessed, or you can replace that word with happy because it's what it means. Happy are you who are poor. Happy. You're blessed if you're poor. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus was teaching things that just blew people's minds. He was teaching, listen, I, oh, I, I, I can't spend time on it, but, 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 but what, what he was doing, you know, the, the, the leaders and the Pharisees and the scribes and all these people would teach people that, that you were in favor of God if you had stuff, if you had money, if you had nice clothes, if you had a nice house, if you drove a nice chariot. He was saying that, that, that God favored you. You were blessed if you had those things. And Jesus is turning around saying, no, you're blessed if you're poor. You're blessed if you're hungry. You're blessed when you cry. You're blessed when men hate you. That's crazy. And I don't think that's what Thomas Jefferson meant either when he said that we have an inalienable right to pursue that type of happiness. I, 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 I come to this place and I think about the goals that we set for our lives. Any, any of you guys are goal setters? None. I am a big goal setter. I mean, I, I set goals all the time. I'm, I'm, I set goals before I even got to church today. And, and the thing about goals, I, I'm going to be teaching in the Hispanic church uh, in James chapter, uh, James chapter 3 where he talks about, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. And that in order for us to attain something or do something, there must be a goal. You know, I hear people all the time saying, well, I've got a goal to do this, I've got a goal to do that, you know. And I say, well, how are you going to do it? I don't know, I just have a goal. Well, what's the point? I mean, it's just, all it does is just sounds good that you have a goal. A lot of people say they have goals. It doesn't mean nothing to me if you don't have a plan of action to attain the goals. So I want us to think about that a little bit today. You know, what are our goals? What, is, what, is our, what are our goals in life? I mean, the, the secular world, there's no doubt, has got a lot of goals. We have goals in our career. You know, we have, have goals for young people when they go to school. My goal is to go to college. My goal is to be able to graduate from college and get a good job. My goal after college is to get married. My, my goal after that is maybe to have some kids. My goal after that is to take the kids and the family to Disney World, you know. My goal from there is to, to start uh, 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 buying a nice home or all these other things. And then my final goal, you know, is, is to, to set up some plan for my retirement. We, we plan ourselves to death, figuring out what it is that we're to do. We're goal setters. I want to ask you this morning, what goals have you set for your life in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because I know we set a lot of goals for ourselves. What goals have you set in your service to God? I, I know that, uh, that it's something that we think about as far as our own personal lives, but I wonder, I wonder if we truly consider what it is that my goal is in serving Jesus. And I tell you this, I believe that our number one goal in, in, in for, to God is to be like Him. It should be our number one goal. That's where we should probably start. In Colossians 1, 9, and 10, it says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you, with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, 
Paul says, how? Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Goals. Goals. Are these your goals? Romans 12, 2. Bobbin knows this one. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Goals. Change your mind. Change the way you think. What are your goals this morning? And I just ask that your entire goal system center around you and what you believe and what it is that makes you happy. You, you, you. Or do your goals center on God, desiring to be more like the Son Jesus? You know, what are your goals? What does your pursuit of happiness look like? What does your pursuit of happiness look like? Now, if your number one goal is to be more like Christ, then you've got to have a plan. You can't just say, well, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Him. I'm okay. Bless your heart. That's what we say in the South. Well, oh, bless your heart. And, and what we're thinking, you dummy. Let me give you some ideas. If you want, if you want, to, if you want that as your goal, if that's something you want to accomplish, number one thing you've got to do is read your Bible every day. Don't, don't tell me that I want to be like Jesus and the only time you crack this thing open is when you come here on Sunday. Or you don't even have to bring it now because we got it all up on the screen. I don't, have to even, I don't have to even own a Bible, Steve. I got an app. Read your Bible. I've been telling this to the Hispanic church ever since I've been preaching to them. And this is one of the things that I try to emphasize more than anything else. Do not come here. Do not come. Don't even come to church. I tell them this. I'm more blunt with them, I guess. Do not even come to church if you've not read what, what you know that we're going to be studying next week. Don't even come. Don't even come because you apparently are not interested. You're not really interested in what God is going to teach you. Read it. Read it. So you want to grow. You want to be more like Christ. Read your Bibles. Another thing is that we should pray on a regular basis. We talked about prayer the other week. Pray. Pray. I asked, I asked some of you, how many, how many in here has prayed a whole day, nonstop. Got off somewhere by yourself and just prayed all day, all night long, like Jesus did. He's going to choose 12 knuckleheads, and he gets off by himself, and he prays all night. We need to be praying. You want to be like Christ? Well, that's the greatest example that he's given us, is to pray. We need to be prayer warriors. It should be so natural for us to pray, it would be like breathing. It's not even something that it should be an involuntary reflex that we have. Another thing is you could have a home Bible study. Well, I don't know how to teach, Steve. Well, who cares? You got a book here, you got an instruction book, you know some things. The problem that I always have with people is as they begin to mature and learn and learn, and all they want to do is keep it to themselves. What good is that? What, what good are you? I mean, if, if you know some things, if, you, if God has taught you some things, and you've experienced some things, and you're not sharing them with anybody. Another great thing, if you want to be like Christ, is to begin to visit people in need. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I wonder how many people have been to a nursing home this week. I, you know, I go, I go in there, and I, and I hear people talk about their families, you know, the decisions they're having to make. That's so difficult. It's so hard. I mean, we've been there. We understand it. It's so hard when, when, when you've got... A, but I'm telling you, friends, I've been in nursing homes, and there are people that are there that nobody visits. Nobody. Let me, let me tell you what I... This is what I tell the couples that come to me that have marital issues, okay? This is what I'm going to tell you. So if you've got some marital problem, you come to me, and you want some counseling, this is one of the first things I'm going to tell you to do. And you're going to think this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I said, I want both of you to go to a nursing home this week. That's what I tell them. Both of you go to a nursing home this week. I want you to go to the director of the nursing home, and I want you to ask them, which is the person in here that nobody visits? And I want you to go see them. And I don't want you to see them one week. I want you to go see them the next week, and the next week also. Because we get so caught up in ourselves, you know? Well, my husband, he is this, and my wife, she's that. And I just, it's not about all of that. There's something bigger than you and your husband or you and your wife, Okay? If you want to be like Jesus and you say that's one of your goals in life, then go do something. Go visit somebody that nobody visits. Go love somebody that nobody is loving. And you'll begin to love each other in ways that you never could before. 
So you think, well, I don't want to go see Steve about marital counseling, but I don't want to go to the nursing home. Well, don't come see me. Because <clears throat> that's one of the first things I'm going to tell you. And look, I expect you to do it. <laughs> I'm not telling you this just because it makes me feel good to say Because if you're not going to do it, don't come back. Don't, don't, don't come and, and, and just say, well, because what people want is to say, Steve, I want you to fix her. Fix her, you know, because she'll, she'll think right. Or, or Steve, I want you to, he, he's just so dumb. He just won't do these things. I don't care. And if you're interested in, in your marriage working, and you will, if you will seek God in all of these things, and the way that you're going to do it is by, is, is your faith is going to be seen in what it is that you do. Your salvation is not based on that, but your faith is going to be seen in what it is that you do. Anyway. I, I want you to, let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. Let's, i got to hustle. I've only gone through the first page on this, and I've got a long ways to go. Oh, goodness. Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 1, I'm going to read, I've got, I got some scripture to read, 1 through 16, and then I'm going to read 34 through 39. You know the story, Jesus sends out the 12. And I, so I want, the reason I say this, you know, when I'm, I'm talking about this, you know, especially in our, in our goal setting of the day. I want us to just think about this as, as far as goal setting. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. It's big stuff, we could talk about this a lot, but we, we, not, we won't today. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, which we know as Nathaniel, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And this is what he told them to do. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Message hasn't changed, okay? The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons freely. You have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. In whatever town or village you enter, each search for some worthy person there and stay at his house. That's a worthy person. Okay. <laughs> Stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give, him, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake, shake the dust off your feet when you leave Then and that home or, or town. And I tell you the truth, I will, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore... Be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. I want to go to verse 34. Very, very uh, familiar passage. Uh, do not suppose that I have come to bring, and Jesus is building a case on all of this. Do not suppose that I have come to bring a case uh, or peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father and a daughter against the mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Amen? Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take, take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus sends out these 12 guys that he loves more than anybody. He loves them. The best friends. Those 12 guys were closer to him than anybody else on earth. And he sends them out into the world. Now, you and I most likely wouldn't send our friends out into the dangers of the world. We wouldn't send them into a den of wolves. Jesus sends these men out to heal sick people and cast out demons and raise the dead and cleanse leprosy. And, and he sends them into these rough areas of Palestine. He's, he's, they're not going on a cruise. He's, he don't have tickets to Disney World that he's sending. This is, we think of a reward. See, this is a reward. Jesus looks at this. This is your reward. This is, what I'm, this is your bonus. I, I'm so happy with you guys. I'm going to send you out so that you can be around people that are going to hate you. God bless you, man. I love you. 
No, we, we look at it this way. Well, it, well, if he really loves me, he's going to send me, you know, on a trip to somewhere that I love to go, you know, somewhere I can relax and take it easy and, and, and eat a lot of pizza. Kim and I took vacation this past week, and thank you for letting us have it, and uh, I am so glad to get back to work. My wife loves to work, and uh, she has, uh, we have done a lot of stuff this week, done a lot of things. You see this here, didn't you? Did you sit, no, see the little knot there? Yeah. Yeah. That's when I was taking too long a break. No, that's not. <laughs> I was pulling up, and so my wife had a cast on her arm, you knew that, and she was, she's out working with a chainsaw. My, my wife is not a sissy, man, she's tough. She's working a chainsaw out in the back, and she's pulled on this vine and pulled and pulled and pulled, and she couldn't get it out, because she, she, she don't have the, the girth that I have, you know. And so I'm, I'm watching her, I enjoy watching her work like that. I'm just, yeah, wow, you're awesome. And, and, uh, and, and so finally I go back there after I felt like it was, you know, way past the point that I should have been in helping and, 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 and so I'm not, she must have set it up. I'm pulling, pulling, pulling on this vine, and pow! Another vine comes loose right in here. Blood everywhere. I nearby hit my knees. And I look over, and she got a little grin. Now, she, 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 weren't, she weren't smiling. I don't think she was smiling. I couldn't see through the blood. But um, <laughs> would we send people, though? I get so off track. Would we send people, would we send people into a place that we know that they would be harmed if you love them. If you love them. Would you send somebody? Would you send your family? Would you send your son? Would you send your daughter? I mean, you got some little ones now. I'm, I'm watching you. I'm watching them grow. What are you encouraging them to do? I, I, I bet. I, I bet we, if, if, if your kids come to you and say, you know, Dad, you know, I think God's calling me into the mission field. And, and not only that, I think He's calling me into the Middle East. I mean, what are you going to say? Come here, sit down, son. Let me talk about this. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about God. Because I think you got to, I think you're misunderstanding some things. Because God loves you. And, and the truth is, when God loves you, He wants you happy. Read it. There it is, happy. He says, happy. I, I came to give you happiness, you know. Pull that scripture out somewhere. And, and, and never would He want you to be harmed. And never would He want you to be in a situation where you might well be killed. This is our kids because we would never encourage them to go to some place where they very likely may die. Would we? Would we, would we even in, 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 our, in our raising them up teach them about the values of serving God? Or are we spending so much time in making sure they, they, they understand that they've got to get good grades because those good grades are going to lead to a good college and that good college is going to lead to a good job and that good job is going to lead to a good, good husband or a good wife. Is this, is this the direction we're, we're sending our kids? You know, people, I mean, and when you ask those questions, we look at that and you say, but that's just too dangerous. And, and, and one of the most common things I hear people say, and I've heard it, <coughs> is that can't you serve God right here? There's plenty of lost people right here. You don't have to go halfway across the planet. Don't you love these people around around here? It might even cause them to feel guilty, you know, for thinking about taking their family there. We want to let them know that, don't you understand God's will in your life? It's for you to be happy and not miserable and certainly not to be persecuted. I wonder what Bible we're reading when we give that type of advice. But here we see the Lord sending these men off, these guys that he loved. And he said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. <laughs> what do wolves do to sheep? What do they do? They eat them. They sure do. They eat them. They slaughter them. That's, that's the way to show you love them. Okay. And I, and I can imagine the looks on the disciples' faces when they're doing that. Don't he, I thought he said he loved us. He's telling us not to bring no food, no money, no, no jacket, no extra shoes, no, no nothing. No, you know how I like to eat, Lord. There's nothing wrong with me bringing a biscuit. Don't bring nothing. Don't bring nothing. Good shepherd. Yeah, okay. Is this the pursuit of happiness when we think about it? Is this what our pursuit of happiness should look like? Here's Jesus saying, I love you. I'm going to send you. 
this is not the American way. I, I think this is one of the things that we get hung up on. This, this is not what we would consider as the pursuit of happiness. And this is not, this is not safe and, 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 and it's, it's, it's not prosperous. So it can't be from God. And I tell you this because there's so many people in the day that preach and teach that if, you, if you're prosperous, if you have this and, you have, and you're not and, and you're not persecuted, then it's proof that God loves you, that you're in His will. It is the proof that you are not if you're not persecuted. We deceive ourselves and we've done it because we've made God into our image rather than we conform to the image of God Himself. You and I wouldn't do anything that would be dangerous or risky or cost, and God certainly wouldn't want us to do that either. And Jesus not only tells these men that he loves them, they send them to the wolves, but he's also going to say, if you follow me, you know, that your brothers are going to betray you, that your parents are going to turn against you, your children are going to, they're going to want to have nothing to do with you. Well, nobody wants that. Nobody wants to lose our family along the way. You maybe think that this probably will never happen. I'm going to tell you, friends, I have seen it happen. I've, I've seen parents that their, their kids have come to them and, and, and told them that they, 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 they felt God lead them into the ministry, bright people that, that could have been doctors or anything, and, 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 and their parents told them how ridiculous that was. That, and these were Christian, supposedly Christian families, and how ridiculous that was. You're wasting your talent. You're wasting your talent to serve God in this way. You could be doing so much more. You could be earning so much money. You could be doing so many other things. And because they continued in their belief and followed the direction that God sent them, their parents had nothing to do with them afterwards. Don't tell me that if you follow Christ, that those that you love won't betray you. I know they will. See, here's the problem. We say to ourselves that, that if we would all become like Jesus, the world would just love us. And, and the truth is, when you become like Jesus, the world's going to hate you. John 15, 18, 19, it says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you in its own. So there's proof. If you have no per persecution, and if the world just seems to love you for everything that you are, that's probably proof that you're not following the Lord as you should. And as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. So we know that when following Christ that we will be persecuted. We accept that. But how much? You know, because we can say, well, you know, I can take a little ribbon in the break room, Lord. I can take a little joke in here and there. But man, I'm, this, this, this persecution thing, you know, this lifelong persecution thing, this thing where I may even die, that's just a bit too much. Jesus told him, his disciples they'd be arrested, they'd be flogged for his sake. And the truth is, and we saw this last week on the little chart that I put up, that every one of the disciples, every one of them except John, died in a very horrible death. And I, if, if I had time to explain it, we could have went into detail where they died at and, and how cruel it was. Even some of them, we talked about being hacked up, some of them were pulled apart by horses. You know, a lot of times we look at even sometimes a person die early on as a follower of Christ or as a preacher, and especially in the story of Stephen. We, we, you know, people would say, and when they looked at him, say, what a wasted life. You know, he could, have, he could have done so much. Why didn't God let him live? Why didn't he let him do some things? In Acts chapter 7, 59 and 60. <coughs> so while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he said that... When he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. And he goes on in uh, verses 1 through 4, it says in chapter 8, On that day the great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them to prison. We think, what's terrible? That's terrible. But here's the next thing here. Those who had been scattered, listen to what it says, preached the word wherever they went. What we would look at and see what a tragedy if God looks at and says, you know, wow, this is, this is, this is the plan I had. This is, what, this is the purpose I had for you guys. The death of this young preacher would just seem wrong to so many, but so right to God. In 1956, five American missionaries to Ecuador were brutally speared to death 
by a savage Stone Age tribe of Indians, Nate Saint. Do you know this story? Flew a Piper cruiser plane with four other missionaries into the jungles of Ecuador and dared to make contact with the most dangerous tribe known to man, the, Wadoni, the Wadonis, were also known as the Alcas or the Naked Savage. After seven, several months of exchanging gifts and, 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 and trying to meet these tribe, tribal people, they were, they were speared to death and hacked to pieces. Never had the opportunity to witness. Never had the opportunity to even share Jesus with the first one yet. Trying to build a relationship. Two years later, the wife of the one that was killed and, 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 and one of the other kinsmen went in there and lived with this Wadoni tribe for two years. They stayed there with them, led them to the Lord. <coughs> even the one that actually killed her husband became good friends with her, with her husband's wife. And, 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 and people look at what a tragedy, but what happened in those late 50s was the greatest movement of missionaries that went into the world of, of, of the deepest, darkest places where, where there had been no civilized man had been. The greatest movement of, of missionaries that took place then more than any other time. Why? Because these men were slaughtered. Because these men were see, because of what we would see as something as a tragedy became the greatest outreach of, of mission work into these darker areas in the continent. If you get a chance, watch the movie. It's The End of the Spear. It's an excellent movie. Why, why am I telling you all this? You probably ask me that every Sunday. Why is he telling us all this? Is, is it because I want to encourage you to go into the mission field? Is that what it is? It, it is because we should see the goals that we set for our lives as the same as Jesus would set. What might seem as a tragedy to most is success in the eyes of the Lord. See, it's, as we look at these Beatitudes, the, the teachings that Jesus is, is so opposite, is so opposite of everything that seems natural. The kingdom of God. Apostle Paul saw it totally different. That is about tragedy and death. And Philippians 1, 20 and 26 is, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is to gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will, be, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Now why shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. It is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. What are your goals? If they're, if they're like most of ours, to be safe and comfortable. They're, they're not goals that cause us to take any risk or step out on our faith. They're not goals that would cause harm to come to ourselves or to our families. They're goals that will make us happy, fat, and comfortable. But friends, Jesus never called us to be them. I hate to be the one to break your bubble about this. But he calls you to risk it all. He, calls, he called us to give it all up. He called us to suffer for his namesake. He called us to take up our cross and follow him. These were his goals for us. During those first 300 years after, after the death of Christ, there was great persecutions in Rome, starting with Nero and, 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 and proceeded for many years. And, and the Christians of that time, they, would build, they, they dug out these great catacombs that were underneath Rome. And, and, and they would bury their dead there that had been slaughtered in the arenas. And, and, and to identify the homes of the Christians in that area, they would put a fish on their door so that one Christian would know that another Christian lived at this particular place. We do that. We got them on our bumpers of our cars, on our mailboxes. But we don't consider the price that was paid by those that put that fish on their door. The, 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 the death and the agony 
and, 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 and their undying devotion to Christ, even through the worst of circumstances, where fathers and mothers and children stood together and waited until the lions and the bears ate them alive. We take it for granted. We take it for granted the freedoms that we have in Christ. That we, we sit here today relaxed and, and comfortable. And, 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 and there are people still today around the world that have to hide at night with the lights out to study God's Word because they know that they will be killed. We celebrate the birth date of our nation this week. And do we even consider the countless lives that paid the price for the freedoms that we take advantage of today? So that we could pursue happiness? I'm not asking you today to stand in the lion's den with Daniel, friends. I'm not, I'm not asking you today to stand in the, in the arena where Nero will martyr you. I'm not asking you to go into the mission field and uh, stay with a tribe of cannibals. But I am asking you to take some time today and set some real goals for yourself as to where you see yourself this year with the Lord. And, and not only that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge each of you to take a chance. To take a chance. Step out of your comfort zone this week. And I, and I say this week, don't, I'm not, I don't mean this month or this, this year or sometime in your lifetime. I'm talking about do it now. We just talk about stuff way too long. I'm talking about do it now. Do it now. So that you can really experience what it means to be blessed by God. Do something risky. Do something that's going to cause you to be uneasy. Visit somebody that you wouldn't normally visit. Go talk with somebody that you don't really like. Share the gospel with somebody that you may not even want to share it with. Give to somebody that you wouldn't normally give to. Make some sacrifice. God, God didn't call us to run away. God, God called us to move forward. He called us to be prepared to fight. You don't have what you have just because that you can have more. You've not received what you've received from Jesus intellectually just because you can know more. I, I just wonder, are we going to continue to live the soft life that we've grown, grown, grown comfortable with? I'm, I'm just asking us to step out of the box, that box that we've packed our own self into. Get out of it. Is your only goal in life the pursuit of happiness? Or is your desire the same or that of Jesus? Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. Maturity, completeness. Do you not want that? Is that not a goal in your life? We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If you're really a patriot, friends, if you genuinely are concerned about this nation, if you earnestly want God to bless her, then live a life in harmony with God. So as we celebrate, again, the birth of our nation, pray for our country that it might have a new birth of freedom, not a freedom from God which ultimately leads to slavery, but rather a freedom built upon God and His commandments and His Son, Jesus Christ. And also may each one of us as individuals reaffirm our, not independence, but our dependence on God. And then as did the founding fathers of our country, we find in Him our life and our liberty and our happiness. God bless America. Let's pray. Father, I pray your blessings on this nation. I know, Lord, you have a great purpose for this people. And I pray, God, as we have
turned so far from the direction in which you freed us from that we recognize the risk that we're in when we don't depend upon you. I pray, God, for our leaders in our nation. I pray for our president. I pray for our Congress. I pray for our local leaders. I pray for our churches, Lord, that they will, they will continue to preach the truth of the Bible and not some watered-down plurality that is so prevalent in the world today. Let us stand with you, O Lord. Place us in the gaps and teach us not to be afraid. I thank you, Lord, for the many blessings on this nation. And I pray that this nation will seek you again so that we can be truly blessed. I pray in Jesus' name.